Hi, I'm Ellen Stoner. I'm an optician instructor at Durham Technical Community College. These tapes are going to be the lessons in Theory 1 and Theory 2 in the Optician program. I'm a licensed optician in North Carolina. I was originally licensed in Connecticut and Massachusetts. I did my two-year degree at Worcester Technical Community College in Worcester, Massachusetts. I've worked for small chains, I worked for large chains, I've worked for independent opticians, and I've worked in an ophthalmology practice, so I have a lot of practical experience. This is Brent. Hello, my name is Brent McCardle, and I'm an optician instructor here at Durham Technical Community College. I have been an optician for 20 years. I have worked in various different locations and uh, chains and independents. Um, and I grad got my two-year degree from uh, here at Durham Tech. Okay. I want you to know that these lectures are going to go along with the internet courses. They are supplemental to the internet courses. They will not replace your reading. They will not replace your doing exercises. I would like you very much to, when you do each lesson, first read the lesson on the internet or print it off of the internet and read it. Then come back and listen to the tape. The tape will make more sense if you've got some idea to start with from the reading. Then go back and do the reading again. Make sure you do all of the exercises. That's where you're actually going to learn how to do this material. I had a person once described to me watching someone else ride a bicycle. You can watch someone ride a bicycle for a long time. The first time you get on the bike, you're gonna fall down. If all you do is watch me and Brent do the exercises, if all you do is just read how to do the problems uh, in the lectures, and then you try to do it by yourself without doing the exercises yourself, they're not going to work for you. You need to do the exercises yourself, even for the ones that seem easy. What I would like you to do is read the internet lesson first. Either read it on the, the screen or print it off and read it. Then come and watch the video. If the video is going to make more sense to you if you first read the lessons. Then go back, reread the lesson, read the lesson in the textbook, work all of the problems. It's important that you work the problems. Then watch the, the video as a supplemental tool to the lessons. It's important that you do all three. Watch the video, read the lessons, read the textbook. The lessons are not going to cover everything that's in the textbook. The textbook material is part of the lesson. Work every problem yourself. Then come back and check my answers or Brent's answers. I hope you enjoy this class and don't ever hesitate to call your instructor and ask questions once you've gone through the material and don't understand something. Thank you. This next set of videos is going to cover resulting and resolving PRISM. One of the things that we've been doing up until now with PRISM is always talking about it in terms of its having base up, base down, base in, and base out. If you take this lens, and we're going to take a close up of it in a minute, but you'll see that it has one thick edge and one thin edge. The thick edge is the base, and the base is always what we're using as a reference point for prism. The two important items with prism are the amount of prism and the direction of the base. And if you remember, we are referencing the base, but what happens when you look through the prism is that the image moves towards the apex. So if I'm holding it with base down, then the image of my eye is displaced up. If I hold it to my right side, the image displaces to my left side. If I'm holding it base up, the image displaces down. If I hold it to your right, the image displaces to your left. So what's important with PRISM is always the base direction. And up until now, we've been talking about the base direction being up, down, in and out. If you remember, we have two different categories that we place prism in. 
We talk about it as unwanted prism when the glasses aren't made correctly. And talking about up, down, and in and out for unwanted prism is sufficient because we're just checking to see whether or not the glasses are so far out of tolerance that we can't dispense them. But the second type of prism is prism that the doctor asked for. And when the doctor asks for the prism, the chances are it's not going to be just up, down, in, or out. So we're going to have to be able to indicate that the base is at 135, or at 45, or at some other orientation besides just up, down, in, and out. We are going to start by looking at a pair of glasses. Now, up until now, usually when I've talked about prism, I've just used one lens or the other. But everything that we do now, it's going to be important to know whether you're looking at the right lens or the left lens. And you remember from earlier theory classes that when we're doing a drawing of a lens, we are drawing it as if you were facing the person with the glasses. So you are not wearing the glasses, you are facing the glasses across the dispensing table. Therefore, this side is the right lens, and this side is the left lens. And you are always going to make that assumption unless you're told otherwise. We're always going, also going to look at these lenses in terms of quadrants. Looking at the right lens, this is in, this is up, this is out, and this is down. This section, or this quadrant, which we're going to call quadrant one, is up and in. This quadrant, quadrant two, for the right lens is up and out. Quadrant three, is down and out. Quadrant four is down and in. If you look at the left lens and we call the same quadrant quadrant one, on the left lens this is out. This is still up. So quadrant one on our left lens is up and out. Quadrant two on the left lens is up and in. Quadrant three is down and in. Quadrant four is down and out. Why would we choose to do the quadrants this way instead of flipping them? There is a fairly easy answer for that. If you remember when we first started talking about cylinder, over here was zero, up here is 90, over here is 180. Down here, which we didn't talk about then, is 270. And then coming back up again, we get to 360. We don't want to switch that when we go to the left lens. We still want the right side of the lens when we face it to be zero, the top to be 90, the inside to be 180, down to be 270, and then coming back up again to be 360. What's important here is that our quadrant one is always from zero to 90, regardless of whether it's a right lens or a left lens. Quadrant two is from 90 to 180. Quadrant three is from 180 to 270. And quadrant four is 270 to 360. And that's true regardless of whether you're looking at the right lens or the left lens. Up until now, we've talked about axis or cylinder or meridian going from 0 to 180. We've been talking about cylinder lenses, where we have two different major meridians. On this lens, one meridian is in this direction. It's close to Plano, so it has two thin edges on opposite sides of the lens from each other. In the other meridian, it's a minus lens, and so it has two thick edges on opposite sides of the lens from each other. Because everything that happens here 
happens here, all we have to do is describe what's occurring on one half of the lens in order to describe what's occurring on the other half of the lens. If I look at this lens and say that this is my 0, 180 line, then I can say this is 45, up here is 90, this is 135. Whatever is happening here at 45 is the exact same thing that's happening in the lower part of the lens. So I don't need to describe what's happening at 225 because it's the same thing that's happening at 45. The same thing that's happening down here at the bottom of the lens, this is the 270 meridian. On this lens, the same thing is happening at the 90. So I don't have to tell you what happens at 270. I don't have to describe to you what's occurring at 315. It's the same thing that's happening at 135. If I now come over to this lens, this lens has no power, but it does have prism. It has one thin point and one thick point. Now, I need to know where this thick point is. And whatever happens at the thick point is the exact opposite of what happens at the thin point. Now, if I tell you that this is my 0, 180 line, it's completely different if the base is here at 270 or if the base is up here at 90. So I have to be able to describe the whole circle, not just the upper half the way I did with the cylinder lens. Okay, so here I am back with the glasses again, the right lens and the left lens. And let's suppose the doctor tells me that this person's glasses is to have prism in the right lens with the base up and in. That would mean that the base is going to be somewhere here in quadrant one. Let's suppose that the doctor asked for the prism to be with the base at 45. We know that 45 is about halfway between the 0 and 90 marks. So basically we want the prism in this direction. If the doctor asked for two diopters of prism, base up and in at 45, we know exactly what that means. We also know that that would be the exact opposite of having the prism down and out. At 45. We know that this line is our 45 line. It goes from 45 through the center and down to 225. So I can describe this prism either up and out at 45. That describes this prism, the blue prism, completely. When I'm describing the green prism, I can describe it as down and out at 45. I know exactly where 45 is. It goes from this point to this point. And because I'm asking for down, I know that it's in the lower part of the lens. So I have completely described this green prism by saying it's two diopters based down and out at 45. I have a second way that I can describe it. I can say that it's two diopters at 225. I still know exactly where that prism is. Its base is at 225. There's no question now that that's in the bottom part of the lens because 225 is in the bottom part of the lens. So I had one way of describing this blue prism that was in the upper part. I actually have two ways of writing the green prism that's in the lower part. These are called 180 notation and 360 notation. And the definition of 180 notation is that you're giving a prism a mount, indicating whether it's up or down, and then giving 
in axis position for the prism base based on 0 to 180. 360 notation, I'm giving a prism amount and then telling you exactly where that base is. I can go back to the blue prism then and say this is 2 at 45 because I have not told you whether it's up or down. You are forced to say it is at 45 in the upper part of the lens. This cannot be down here. So my two notations, my 180 notation includes the quadrant and the axis between 0 and 180. My 360 notation does not tell me up or down and it gives me an exact position for the base. Down here with the green prism, my 180 notation tells me whether it's up or down. It gives me an actual quadrant and then it lists the axis between 0 and 180. And because this is down, we know that we're going to have to add 180 to this in order to come up with the actual position of the base. So this is our 180 notation where the axis is listed between 0 and 180. This is the 360 notation where I have the actual position of the base. Coming over here, let's suppose we're in the left lens and the doctor asks for a prism of three diopters, base up and in at 120. Is this listed in 180 notation or 360 notation? I hope you answered 180 notation. The reason it's 180 notation is because I have given you a quadrant. I have told you that this is in the upper part of the lens. So actually I'm giving you a hemisphere instead of a quadrant. I've told you that it's in the upper part of the lens. I've also told you that it's in at 120. We know that 120 is here. Therefore, by telling you that it's in at 120, we know it has to be a left lens. If it were a right lens at 120, it would be out. So this notation, along with telling us which hemisphere it's in, is also actually telling us which lens, whether the lens is mounted on the right side of the frame or the left side of the frame. So it's 180 notation because it's telling us the actual quadrant and because the axis is listed between 0 and 180. If I ask you to write this prism amount in 360 notation, what would you write? I hope you said three diopters of prism, which will never change, at, and then the actual position of the base, which, because this is in the upper part of the lens, is 120. As long as our prism base is in the upper part of the lens, the axis is not going to change. Let's suppose the doctor asks for four diopters of prism, base down and out, at 175. Is this 180 notation or 360 notation? That's right. It's 180 notation because I've given you a base position and because the axis is between 0 and 180. But this is down and you know that 175, which is over here, is not down. It's in the upper part of the lens. 
Therefore, the actual base position has to be over here in quadrant four. If I add 180 to my 175, I get 355. So this base direction is actually at 355. Now I want you to write it down, this prism, in 360 notation. I am hoping that you wrote down four diopters of prism, which is not going to change, at 355. Whenever we are in the lower part of the lens, the axis for these two notations is going to change by 180 degrees. If I were had given you the four diopters of prism at 355 and asked you to write it in 180 notation, you would have subtracted 180 from it and gotten 175. Those two are always going to differ by 180 degrees if the prism base is in the lower part of the lens, the two notations will have the same axis if the prism base is in the upper part of the lens. I've got a couple of examples here of four different prism amounts that we're going to look at, at their not notation and at where they are on the lenses. In each case, there are several things that you should be able to tell me. The first thing you should be able to tell me is, have I written these in 180 notation or in 360 notation? Yes, they're in 180 notation because all of them have their axes between 0 and 180, and all of them are telling me exactly which quadrant they're in. The first thing I want to know is the quadrant that each of these is in. The second thing will be which lens. The third will be what it looks like in 360 notation. Let's take the first one. I have one diopter of prism based down and out at 12. If I look, for example, on this left lens, which is the one closest to me at the moment, where is 12? 12 is here. It's down, which means it's going to be in the lower part of the lens. Is this down and out? No, it's down and in. Therefore, 12 down and out is over here on the right lens in the third quadrant. So I've determined that this is quadrant three, right lens. Looking at this, because it's down, in order to convert it to 360 notation, what am I going to do with this axis? This axis is between 0 and 180. I need to make it between 0 and 360. If it were in the upper half of the lens, I would leave it alone. Because it's in the lower half of the lens, I'm going to add 180 to it. What do you get when you add 12 to 180? So my answer over here is going to be one diopter of prism. This is 360 notation, so I am not going to say base down and out at 192. I have now completely described this prism. It is one diopter at 192. I know exactly where 192 is. So I know that that prism base is right here. I know that it's in the lower half of the lens. I know that it's in quadrant three. But if I had started with the one diopter at 192, I would not know whether it's the right lens or the left lens. There is a third way to write this prism, and a lot of doctors are going to this. 
and that's to say that it's one diopter of prism based down and out at 192. I have now completely described this prism. I've told you whether it's in or out. I've given you the exact position of the base. What I have written here does not meet my definition of either 180 notation or 360 notation. What it does do is describe more completely than the normal 360 notation does because it is also telling you which lens it's in. On tests and quizzes, if I ask you for 180 or 360 notation, this answer will not be acceptable. I want you to know the difference between those two notations. Because it contains the base down notation, it is not 360. Because the axis is greater than 180, it is not 180 notation. It is, however, my preferred way to write prism. So in the real world, when you're writing prism, I would rather see you do it this way. But on tests or quizzes, when I ask you for 180 notation, it will look like that. When I ask you for 360 notation, it will look like this. All right. Looking at the second one, we have three and a half diopters of prism up and out at the axis of 15. Where is 15? It's right about here. This is up and out, so we know that it's in the upper half of the lens, so we're going to stay with the 15. It's out. On the right lens, 15 is in. On the left lens, 15 is out. So, which quadrant is this in? Which lens is it? And how would you write it in 360 notation? This is in quadrant one. It's the left lens, and it's written 3.5 diopters at 15. The reason why I have not changed the axis is because it's in the upper part and the 15 is already correct. That is the exact position for that prism. Looking at the third one, I have two and a quarter diopters of prism up and in at 122. It's up, so we know it's going to be either quadrants one or two. It's at 122. 122 is in quadrant two. So we know it's quadrant two. 122, quadrant two is in only for the left lens. So it's a left lens. Because it's in quadrant two, it's in the upper half of the lens, the axis stays the same, and I'm going to write it 225 at 122. The fourth one, six diopters of prism, down and in at 130. I want you to decide what quadrant it's in, which lens it is, and how to write it at 360 notation. Pause you one second. When you come back from those, do some little, okay, or, all right. Okay. Okay. I hope that you told me here that this was quadrant four, right lens, and that it was 6.0 at. You had to add 180 to this because it was a down. That gave you an axis of 310. So you should have written it as quadrant four, right lens, six diopters of prism at 310. These two differ by 180 degrees because it's in the lower part of the lens. I have a new set of examples here for you. I've got five of them this time. The first thing I want you to tell me is what notation are they in? 
I hope you answered 360. They're 360 because I have not told you up or down. They're in 360 because the axes are exactly where they're supposed to be on the lens. The axes are between 0 and 360. You will notice that three of them are also between 0 and 180. What does it mean that these three in 360 notation are also between 0 and 180? That's right. It means they're in the upper part of the lens. The two that are between 180 and 360 are in the lower part of the lens. Starting with this first one, two and a half diopters at 280. What quadrant is 280 in? 280 is between 270 and 360, so it's in quadrant four. I've told you that it's the right lens. Therefore, what is the up, down, in, and out direction for quadrant four right lens? It's down and it's in. I still have to tell you what the base direction is. Here's 280. How am I going to determine what 280 is in the 180 notation? When we were going from 180 to 360 notation, we added 180 to the axis. Now I'm going to subtract 180 from the axis. I get 100. Is 100 between 0 and 180? Yes. So now I have written this. I haven't written it yet, but I will, as 2.5 diopters base down and in at 100. This is the 180 notation for my 360 notation. In order to go from 360 notation to 180, I have to determine what quadrant it is. Using which lens it is, I have to determine whether it's up, down, in, or out. And then if it's down, I have to subtract 180 from the axis. That gives me my 180 notation. Taking the second one, left lens, three diopters of prism at 132. What quadrant is 132? Then for the left lens, for the quadrant you choose, is it up, down, in, or out? And then tell me what the axis should be. I hope that you said that it was quadrant two. For the left lens, quadrant two is up and in, so it's 3.0, base up and in. And because it's already between 0 and 180, because it's up, the axis is 132. These two axes are the same because it's in the upper part of the lens. I want you to do 3, 4, and 5. For the third one, 205 is here in quadrant 3. For the right lens, quadrant 3 is down and out, so we have one diopter of prism, down and out. It was 205, it's down, 205 is more than 180, so we're going to subtract 180 from it. We get 25, and the 180 notation for this prism is one diopter, down and out, at 25. The fourth one, an axis of 80 is in the first quadrant. Left lens, first quadrant is up and out. So I have six diopters, up and out. It's in the upper part, so I don't have to change the axis. It's already between 0 and 180, so I get 80. So number four is four diopters, up and out at 80. Number five is at 90. 
Where is 90? 90 is straight up, okay? It's not in a quadrant. It's between quadrants one and two. It's a right lens, so it's just 0 0.5. I can say base up if I choose to do so. I can say 090. So to be consistent, this would be 0 0.5 up at 90. If I had given you this one at 270, it would be 0 0.5 down at 90 because down in 90, down in 90 is 270. The 270 is 180 degrees away. There are two things that I want you to notice. When I taught you about cylinder, writing cylinder prescriptions, I insisted that your axis always be three digits. So if you had a cylinder axis of 45, I insisted that you write that as 045. And I will remind you, my rules for writing a prescription are for you and me. They are not for the doctor, and they're not for the optician you work for. They're for you and me. I am hoping that you will continue in your profession writing the prescriptions correctly, which is three-digit axes. You will also notice, especially if I graded you off, some last semester for not putting a zero, that sometimes I'm doing it on prism notation and sometimes I'm not. We are not quite as insistent that this be three-digit notation. I would prefer that you wrote it in three-digit notation, so I should have written that as 080 and this as 025, and I would prefer you do it that way. But if you're in my class this spring, I will not count off if you leave that zero off of the axis. The other thing that I want you to do is I want you to be able to write this diagram on a piece of paper without looking it up. And it's a relatively simple diagram. It's the two lenses going from 0 to 90 to 180 to 270 to 360 so that you have that for both lenses. On your diagram, on the right lens, you're going to write up and in, up and out, down and out, down and in. On the left lens, this is up and out up and in, down and in, down and out. If you do this, and then every time you're given one of these problems, whether you're going from 360 notation to 180, or from 180 notation to 360, you will always be able to find exactly where that base is. And then you will be able to see whether or not the answer you're getting is reasonable. If it's an up and in, and you're getting an axis that's bigger than 180, then you know something is wrong because up and in is quadrant one, and that's always between zero and 90, okay? So that whatever answer you get, you can go back to this diagram and say, did I change quadrants? You look at the quadrant that the original problem was in, you look at the quadrant that your answer is in, it's not going to change. All we're doing is changing notation. We are not changing where the prism base is. That's the end of this first segment. Please go back and reread the lecture and reread the pages in the textbook. This part I didn't really do as much with in the lectures, in, the, in either the book or the lectures on the internet. I'm doing more of it here now because I found that a lot of people get confused in this notation. And it's really not confusing at all as long as you recognize what quadrant your prism is in and you make sure that your answer is in the same quadrant that the original was in. Thanks.
Okay, this next section of the videos is going to be on resultant prism. And first I want to explain to you why we would do resultant prism. One example of what might happen would be if you received a prescription such as this. This prescription has, happens to have no power. And do remember in everything we're doing, we're not going to be dealing with or changing in any way the power in the lens. But the doctor has also prescribed some prism. Six diopters base up in the right lens, four diopters, I'm sorry, six diopters base in in the right lens, four diopters base up in the left lens. This means that in the right lens, there's going to be six diopters of prism with a base over here towards the nose. That means this lens is going to be very thick on the right side at the nasal side. And if you've ever made glasses, you know that getting thickness in here on the right side, it's going to make it hard for the glasses to go together well, and it's going to be visually not terribly pleasing. The left lens is going to have four diopters base up. That means this edge up here at the top of the left lens is going to be very thick. Again, it won't be cosmetically pleasing and it's going to be harder to get into the lens. So there, under some circumstances, we might want to adjust this slightly and we are not changing it, but we are going to do it a little bit differently than what's actually asked for here. Now before I start, I want you to understand that what we're going to do is something that either the doctor will ask you to do or you will call up and ask the doctor for permission. There are times if there is something occurring that's requiring that this person have a fair amount of prism in the glasses. And what we're about to do with it may or may not work for the person. So it might be legitimate that the doctor will say, no, you can't do that. And what we're going to ask to do is called splitting the prism. We talked about this in a course earlier. Uh, possibly your last semester, but this we did splitting prism in an earlier lesson. And what we do is we keep the prescription, which in this case was Plano. We take half of the prism of the base in and put it in both lenses. Because it's base in in the right lens, that means the base is here, the eye is being sent out. So the eyes are being diverged from each other. We still want to have six diopters of divergence. In order to do that, we're going to have base in. We keep the base direction the same for the right lens. We have base in for the left lens. These two compound each other, and the result is six diopters of divergence. This way it was written, all of that divergence was for the right eye. This way it's written, we are splitting that divergence between the two eyes, but we still have divergence, horizontal divergence. For the left prism, we're again going to split that in half, two diopters for each lens. Base up in the left lens means we're sending the eye down because it goes towards the apex. So the way the doctor has this written, the right eye is looking straight ahead, the left eye is looking down like this, we have vertical divergence. I want to write it so that the eyes are still diverging, but I'm splitting that prism. So the base up in the left lens, I'm still going to send the left eye down, but I want to send the right eye up in order to have the eyes diverging. So I have the left with base up, which is where it was originally, the right with base down, so I'm still diverging the, same, the two eyes by a total of four diopters. And this is what we ended out with when we talked about split prism before. If you've done any lensometry at all, you know that there isn't any way of dotting three diopters base in and two diopters base down in the lens meter. How are you going to check out whether or not these glasses have the right amount of prism in them? How are you even going to determine what your major reference point or your prism reference point is in the glasses in order to determine if the 
horizontal pupillary distance or the horizontal uh, major reference point distance is correct. So we have to have another way of writing this. And we're going to write it so that it looks similar to what we talked about in the last segment in either 180 or 360 notation. And that's what's called finding the resultant prism. So now we are going to start with the split prism that we just determined. We have checked with the refractionist and determined that it is okay for us to split the prism. We now need to find the resultant prism, the prism that we will actually be able to dot in the lens meter. And we're going to write it either in 180 or 360 notation. We're starting with the right lens. The prescription was Plano. We had three diopters base in and two diopters base down. We need to look at what that means. Here I have the right lens and it always helps me to draw where the nose is, either the bridge or put an N. When you're doing one of these and you're just working with one lens, you want to make sure you put an, a visual on there for yourself so that you automatically know where the nose is and which direction in is. So we've got prism that's three diopters base in and two diopters base down. I can create a number line on these axes. And when you do this, you want to do it on graph paper or something where the numbers, where the, these lines are correctly spaced and evenly spaced. If I say, okay, I need three diopters of base in. This is the zero point where there is no prism. In is this direction because it's towards the nose. Here's one, two, and three. So this prescription is asking for three diopters of prism base in, so base on the zero line in three diopters. It's also asking for two diopters base down. So here is my two down, and I'm essentially combining prism that's here and prism that's here. If I were to draw a box, what that does is give me prism with the base here over three horizontally down two vertically. For those of you who remember your geometry or your trigonometry, what we have here is a right triangle. What we need is the hypotenuse of the right triangle or the long side, the side that's opposite the right angle. We have a horizontal distance of three and a vertical distance of two. What we need is the long side, which is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. And I'm going to call it the prism amount because that's what it is. So my P here stands for prism amount. My two is my vertical amount. The three is my horizontal amount. In order to determine what our prism amount is and what this angle is, we have to do a little bit of basic trigonometry. For those of you that that sends into a panic, we are only going to use the basic functions of sine, cosine, and tangent. We're not going to do any of the rest of the things that I thought were a game, so they were fun for me. Let's review a little bit the functions. The first one was the sine. It was a function, so it required an angle. And what we were doing was taking a ratio of two sides based on that angle. The angle we're going to use is this angle that our triangle makes with a zero point on the lens, on the center of the lens. So the sine of an angle was defined as opposite, which would be this side, over hypotenuse, which would be this side. We're calling the opposite the vertical, and we're calling the hypotenuse the prism. So instead of saying that this ratio is opposite over hypotenuse, I'm going to say the sine is vertical over prism. In other words, the sine of this angle 
is 2 divided by what I don't know. Cosine was the second function. And cosine in trigonometry is defined as the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. In this case, this is the adjacent side, and prism, again, is the hypotenuse. We're calling the adjacent side the horizontal, and the hypotenuse, again, is prism. There's a third function that we're not going to use in this lesson, but we're going to use it in the next one, and that's the tangent. And the tangent of an angle, when you took trigonometry, was defined as the opposite over the adjacent. Opposite, again, for us is vertical. Adjacent is horizontal. So that's going to be vertical over horizontal. There are a variety of ways that you learned to remember these ratios when you took trigonometry, and I'm going to give you a new one. The sine, cosine, and tangent on your calculator, those three keys are always listed next to each other. Sine first, then cosine, then tangent. So what you need to do is remember the ratios. And my mnemonic for the ratios is Vera put her plate very high. So this is Vera put her plate very high. And that's your mnemonic for remembering that the sine is vertical over prism, cosine is horizontal over prism, and tangent, when we're ready to use it, is going to be vertical over horizontal. Now there's one more formula that you had back when you talked about right triangles and trigonometry that didn't use trigonometry, but you probably learned it at about the same time. And that's the formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b were the two short sides of the right triangle, and c was the long side. This is the Pythagoras theorem, for those of you who um, like the names of things. In this case, our version of it is the hypotenuse, or long side, which is prism, is equal to the vertical squared plus the horizontal squared. We have the vertical and we have the horizontal. This one's going to give us our amount of prism. So these are the four formulas that we're going to be using. Some of them we will use in this le lesson. Some of them we're going to be using in the next couple of lessons. Starting then with the Pythagoras theorem, when you solve that, you end out with prism equals the square root of v squared plus h squared. You know v, you know h, so what you're going to punch into your calculator is 2 squared plus 3 squared equals, in order to make sure that you've added those two numbers together, and then square root. And that's going to give you the amount of prism that's present. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9, 4 plus 9 is 13, and the square root of 13 is, you're all doing this with me, right? You're punching in 2 squared plus 3 squared equals, and then square root on your calculator, and you should have 3.60555. So the answer here is 3.60555, and a whole bunch of other stuff after that. This is our prism. So this is the amount of prism that is our resultant, that is the result of three diopters horizontal and two diopters vertical. Back when we first started talking about prism several lessons ago, I told you that a lot of textbooks do prism to two decimal places. I find two decimal places to be 
more than necessary because unless you're talking about 0.33, which is a third, or 0.25, which is a quarter, two decimal places is really more of a um, significance than we can find in the lens meter, which is what we're going to be doing with this. So for me, if you round your prism amounts correctly to one decimal place, I'll be happy. If this comes out close to 0.25 or it comes out close to 0.75, then we'll go to 0.25 and 0.75 because they mean something. The same thing with 0.33 and 0.66. Those mean something. So you can either round them to one decimal place or you can keep that 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 0 0.33 because they, they are meaningful to us. I would not round this to 3.61 because I can't tell the difference between 3.6 and 3.61. So our amount of prism is 3.6. Our first formula was prism is equal to our vertical squared plus our horizontal squared square root and that gave us 3.6 diopters. We now know the prism amount. We need to know what this angle is. We've got several formulas here, one of which gives, gives us the vertical and horizontal and will result in finding the angle. So we're going to use tangent equals vertical over horizontal. That gives us tangent of A. The vertical in this case is the down is 2. The horizontal is the in, which is 3. So in your calculator, you're going to do 2 divided by 3. And what you should have is 0.666666 on forever. In your calculator, you have to find out what angle has that tangent. So you need to find the key on your calculator that looks like this. You probably won't have that as a key. It will probably say tangent, and then above the key, it will say with a minus one. And all that is is mathematical shorthand for find the angle that has that tangent. If you don't remember how to do these, I will remind you that in the formulas textbook, which you're supposed to have because you're supposed to be reading the lessons, that there is practice on doing these on pages 10 through 12. Okay, And that shows you both how to find the tangent of an angle if you know the angle which is using this key by itself, and how to find the angle if you know the tangent, which is this inverse function. On your calculator, you find where it has that tangent to the minus one key, which means you use your shift or second or inverse key, whichever of those keys your calculator has. This one on mine has a shift, so I'm going to say shift tangent. If yours says second, or invert, you will use the second or invert key. So I have in my calculator that 0 0.666. I press my shift tangent, and my calculator says 33.69 and a lot of other digits. So my tangent is 0 0.66. Inverse tangent gives me 33.69 and stuff. For these angles, I can't tell in the lens meter 33.7 from 33.5. It's adequate for us to go to the nearest full angle, and I do want you to round it correctly. This one rounds to 34. So the angle that I'm looking for here is 34. 
I just want to do a quick review on how you're punching these into your calculator. You know that you have either the tape type A calculator or the type B calculator, and don't go by size on these. This is just, I bought that one five years ago and this one more recently. So you should have already long ago done the test that I talk about in your theory book on how to determine whether your calculator is what I'm calling type A or type B. I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem first and punch it into the type A calculator. When you're doing the Pythagorean theorem in the type A calculator, what you're taking is the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. You're going to start inside there and you're going to do 2, your x squared key, plus, and you will notice that it's squared 2, so it's showing 4. You're now going to do 3 and your x squared key, and you'll notice that it's showing 9, which is 3 squared. It has not done the addition. You're now going to press your equals key. That does the addition. 2 squared plus 3 squared is 13. And then you press your square root key. On this calculator, the square root key is above the x squared key, which means I do shift and x squared. Shift and x squared gives me the square root. So I do shift and x squared. That gives me the square root, which is 3.6. If I use the type B calculator, I'm going to punch everything in as if this were a formula. So I'm going to start with a square root. And on this calculator, it's actually a key with a square root on it. And that's just the way this one is done. That, that some type B's you will use the shift, just as in some type A's you'll have a square root key itself. In this case, I'm going to do the square root. And then if I typed in 2 squared, it would take the square root of 2 squared. And I don't want it to do that. I want it to take the square root of the whole thing. So I'm going to punch the open parentheses key. I'm now saying I want the square root of everything that I'm going to put inside this open parentheses. I will now do 2 and the x squared key plus 3 and the x squared key. That's everything that I want it to do the square root of, so I will do the closed parentheses my equal sign, it does everything all at once and gives me the 3.6. So that's how you're going to punch that in and the two different calculators. Going to the tangent function on the type A calculator, I'm going to do 2 divided by 3 equals to actually do the division. That gives me 0.666. I now want to find out what angle has that tangent. On this calculator, here's the tangent key, and you can see the tangent to the minus 1 above it, which means it's shifted. So I'm going to do shift tangent. And this calculator doesn't require the equal sign. It knows that I'm doing the function on what it has in its display and it's giving me my 33.69, which I then round to 34. On the type B calculator, you are going to do this as if it was written out algebraically. And written out algebraically, you have A equals tangent to the minus 1 of 2 divided by 3. That's how you switch tangent from one side of an equation to the other. So I am going to do tangent to the minus 1, which is shift tangent. And then if I punched in 2, it would take the tangent of 2. And I don't want it to do that. I want it to take the tangent of the division. So I'm going to punch in the open parentheses, 2, divide, 3, and close parentheses. So I'm telling it, do this division first, then find out what angle has that tangent. And when I do the equal sign, then it does this calculation, finds the angle with that tangent, it's 33.69. Make sure if you are not getting the answers that I got on that last example, that you are punching them correctly into your calculator. 
There are other ways of punching things into each of these calculators. The two methods that I just showed you are the ones that I find work best for students. If you're using slightly different method of punching them in and you're getting the right answers, that's fine. If you're using a different method to punch them in and you're getting the wrong answers, do it my way. If I come back to this diagram now and take out the things that I don't need, what I have is a prism amount of 3.6 and an angle of 34. We know now that we can write this lens as OD, Plano power. Our prism amount is going to be 3.6 diopters of prism. We know that this is a right lens, so it's down and in. But you still can't tell me what the angle is going to be. Because this 34 is not this meridian. In fact, what we need is this angle. What we have is this angle. This is 360. This 34, in order to get back to this large angle, I have to take 360, subtract 34 from it, and I get 326. So this meridian is the 326 meridian. So my final answer then is Plano with 3.6 diopters of prism down and in at 326. Having determined the 326, that's 360 notation. To convert back from 360 to 180 notation, I'm going to subtract 180 from that, and I will get 146. So in my 180 notation, I'm at 146. In my 360 notation, I'm at 326. I have now taken, determined the resultant prism, the prism that is the result of 3 base in and 2 base down. That resultant prism is 3.6 diopters of prism at 326, or 3.6 down and in at 146. Let's take a look at what will happen with the left lens. This was my right lens. The left lens that we ended out with in that split prism was Plano, three diopters base in, two diopters base up. So now we have a left lens, the nose is over here, this is the nasal side. I want three in, two up, so I'm going to go one, two, three, here's three in. I'm going to go two up, there's two up. If I draw my rectangle, here's my prism amount, and there's my triangle. The prism I don't know. 
I still have a horizontal of 3 and a vertical of 2. And I am still looking for the angle that this prism amount makes with the zero point on the lens. The first thing I'm going to do is find the prism amount. It's vertical squared plus horizontal squared equals square root. You're going to get the same answer, 3.6. So we know that for the left lens, we're going to have 3.6 diopters of prism. We now need to find the angle. The tangent of the angle is vertical over horizontal is again 2 over 3. That's going to be 0.66 repeated on. When you do inverse tangent, you are again going to get an angle of 34. This time, the angle that we found is this one, and the angle that we want is that one. We know that this 34 is going to take us up to 180, so we're going to do 180 minus 34. We end out again with 146, but this time the 146 is where it's supposed to be. It's up here in the upper part of the lens. So we've got 3.6, quadrant 2, left lens is up and in, at 146. What notation have I written this in? That's right, I wrote it in 180 notation. Converting it to 360 notation, what axis will I have? Because it's in the upper part of the lens, we're not changing the axis. The 146 is exactly where it's positioned in the upper part of the lens. So in order to create this pair of glasses that the doctor originally told us was six diopters up in the right lens and four di I'm sorry, six diopters in in the right lens and four diopters up in the left lens, I'm actually going to create it with 3.6 diopters up and in at 146 or 3.6 diopters at 326 in the right lens, which is down here. And I'm going to create in the left lens 3.6 at 146, which is up here. All right. The glasses, when I'm through with them, the right lens will have the prism base down here. The left lens will have the prism base up here. We're going to do two more examples on this video, and then I'm going to let you go back and do the examples in the books. The first example we're going to do is going to be a right lens. It has three diopters of power. The doctor wants five diopters base up prism and six diopters of base in prism. We need to know where to dot this, so we need to find the resultant prism. Our first formula is prism equals square root of vertical squared plus horizontal squared. And by the way, it doesn't matter which order you do them in. You can do them horizontal plus vertical or vertical plus horizontal. It doesn't matter. Looking at what we're given, our horizontal is the in out, so the horizontal is 6. Our vertical is the up down, so the vertical is 5. So we have prism equals the square root of 5 squared plus 6 squared. If I punch it into my type A calculator, I've got 5 squared plus 6 squared equals square root. And that gives me 
7.810249 and stuff, which I'm going to round to 7.8. If you are doing this with your type B calculator, you're going to punch in square root, parentheses, 5 squared plus 6 squared, close parentheses, equals, and that should give you your 7.8. So we know that our prism amount here is going to be 7.8 diopters of prism. We now need to know what the angle is. And we know that the tangent of the angle is equal to vertical over horizontal. Our vertical is 5. Our horizontal is 6. 5 divided by 6 is 0.83, and the 3's repeat. When I do inverse tangent, I get an angle of 39.80, which I'm going to round to 40. So we have a prism amount of 7.8. We have an angle A of 40. Let's look at where we are on this lens. It's a right lens, so the nose is on this side. It's five up and six in. We're going to go up five. We're going to go in six. So this is five, this is six. My prism amount is 7.8. All through class, as we've been going on, I've been telling you that you should be able to look at an answer and tell whether or not it's reasonable. When you look at your prism amount, that's the hypotenuse of a right triangle. The hypotenuse is the long side opposite the right angle. If you get a number that is smaller than either your horizontal or vertical, it's wrong. If you notice, if you add these two together, 5 plus 6 is 11, this number is going to be smaller than that. So if you get a number that's bigger than 11, it's wrong. So for your reasonableness test for your prism amount, it is the largest of the three sizes, so it's going to be bigger than either of the two components, but it's going to be less than the sum of the two components. It's outside of that, you need to go back and recalculate it. My angle is the angle inside this right angle. So I came up with an angle of 40, which is that. When I did the other problems, quadrant 2 and quadrant 4, I had to do something with the angle. In this case, that is, in fact, the meridian that I need, the 40. So in quadrant one, I don't have to do anything to that 40. My answer here is 7.8 of prism at 40. What notation did I just write that in? That's right, that's 360 notation. What would it be if I wrote it in 180 notation? The prism is the same, 7.8. It's a right lens, first quadrant, so it's up and in at 40 because it's an up, so the two angles are the same, the two meridians are the same. This is not the complete answer. The complete answer is to go back to the original prescription. It's a right lens and has a power of 3.0. And if I just move this over a little bit so it's not squeezed that much, which I didn't do. Although we don't normally have to write sphere in there, since I'm writing a lot of other things after it that might be confused with cylinder, I would like to see the SPH standing for sphere. 
after this plus 3. So our answer written in 180 notation is right lens, 3 diopter sphere of power, 7.8 diopters of prism, base up and in at 40, or right lens plus 3 sphere, 7.8 diopters of prism at 40, and that one is written in 360 notation. This would be the complete answer then for the right lens. Okay, now on to our last example for this video. This time we're going to use a left lens. The prescription is minus one power, one diopter base down, and four diopters of prism base in. I want you to determine several things first. I want you to tell me what quadrant this is in. And then I want you to make an estimation of what the prism and what the axis should be. And by an estimation of the prism, I mean what's the lowest amount and the greatest amount of prism. And for the axis, I want you to tell me should it be between 0 and 90, 90 and 180, 180 and 270, or 270 and 360. So you're going to pause the video for a moment and you're going to calculate, you're going to determine that, the quadrant, and what the parameters for the answer should be. Okay, what you should have found was that on the left lens, down and in is down here in the third quadrant. You should have determined that the prism had to be bigger than 4 because it's going to be bigger than both 4 and 1. It should be less than 5 because that's the sum of the two of them. And because it's in the third quadrant, the, the angle of the base should be between 180 and 270 if you're writing it in 360 notation. So let's determine now let's determine now whether or not all of that was correct. I'm going to start with p equals square root of 1 squared plus 4 squared. That gives me a p of 4.123, which I'm going to round to 4.1. So my prism amount is 4.1. Is 4.1 bigger than 4 and smaller than 5? Yes. So I have an increased probability that I punched it in right and that that's a correct prism. The second one is that the tangent of the angle is equal to vertical over horizontal. Of 1 and 4, which one is vertical and which one is horizontal? Down is vertical, so my vertical is 1. 4 is ho in and out is horizontal, so my horizontal is 4. So I have the tangent of A equals 1 over 4, which is 0.25. Taking 0.25 and doing inverse tangent, on my calculator I get 14.036, which I'm going to round to 14. So this is telling me that my angle is 14. Just a few minutes ago, we decided that it was quadrant 3 and the angle needed to be between 180 and 270. And 14 is not between 180 and 270. Let's take a look at what we actually have on the lens. We went vertical or down 1 and horizontal or in 4. So our prism is here and this was our 4.1. The angle that we just found, the angle of 14, is here. But the angle that we need is all of this. Up to here is 180. We need to go past 180 another 14, so we're going to add the 14 to 180 and we get 194. So our answer is going to be to have the axis at 194. Now 194 is bigger than 180, so that places us in 360 notation. 
Therefore, our answer in 360 notation is going to be the left lens minus one sphere combined with 4.1 diopters of prism at 194, which gives us 360 notation. Or, it's a left lens, quadrant 3 is down and in, so we have OS of minus 1 sphere combined with 4.1 diopters of prism based down and in. My 194 is bigger than 180, so I subtract the 180 back again. 194 minus 180 is 14. And my answer is 4.1 based down and in at 14. Now you'll notice that I added 180 and then I subtracted it back again. You'll also notice that each of the quadrants that we did, we had to do something different with the angle. So let's look at exactly what we have to do in each quadrant with the angle. Here is a lens, and here are our four quadrants. And I told you earlier that you should be able to start with a lens and label the quadrants, and you should be able to label the axis, small and large, the, the, the beginning and ending for each quadrant. You also are going to be able to do whether something's up, down, in, or out in each quadrant. If this is a right lens, then this side is in. If it's a left lens, then this side is out. If it's a right lens, then this side is out. If it's a left lens, then this side is in. That's going to help you spot whether it's up and in or up and out, depending on which lens you have. For your axis, if you determine that the answer is in quadrant one, then the axis is going to be A, what you get when you do your inverse tangent, vertical over horizontal. If it's in quadrant two, the angle that you're going to get is this angle with the axis, which is coming back from 180. So in quadrant two, you're going to subtract the angle that you get from the tangent function from 180. In quadrant three, the angle that you get is the angle with this axis that you'll be adding to 180 because you're coming past 180 down to it. So here you will add the angle to 180. And in fourth quadrant, you're coming all the way around and then coming back the amount of the angle. So you're going to have 360 minus A. And that would be how you do your angle if you're doing 360 notation. Now we know that 180 notation in the upper part of the lens is the same. So you will always use A for quadrant 1 and 180 minus A for quadrant 2. In the bottom part of the lens, we subtract 180 from the angle in order to get the 180 notation. When I subtract 180 from this again, I just get A. So in 180 notation, it's just A. When I subtract 180 from 360, I get 180. So in quadrant 4, it's 180 minus A. So your quadrants 1 and 3 are either A as you get it from the calculation, or A in quadrant 1 and 180 plus A in quadrant 3. For quadrants 2 and 4, you're always going to subtract A in quadrant 2, you're going to subtract A from 180. 
and in quadrant four you're going to subtract it either from 360 or from 180. So to review now, if I give you an amount of prism, a horizontal and a vertical, some amount up or down, some amount in or out, in order to determine the resultant prism, you are going to use the Pythagorean formula for those two amounts. You're going to determine which one is vertical and which one is horizontal. And vertical is your up and down, horizontal is the in and out. And then you will do vertical squared plus horizontal squared and the square root of that. That gives you your amount of prism. You will then, and you can do those in either order. It doesn't matter whether you square the vertical first or the horizontal first. But when you do the angle, it will matter. Your vertical goes on top, the horizontal goes on the bottom, so you're going to do a division, and then your inverse tangent, which will give you the angle. You will then use this chart to determine what to do with that angle in order to write your prescription either in 360 notation or in 180 notation. Now I would like you to go back and reread this in the textbook and reread it in the lessons. Make sure that you go through and do all of the problems. If you're getting this and you're understanding it, then it's not going to take you long to do those problems. If you're not getting it, the problems are worked out for you. Try to do it yourself. Don't sit there and just read how I did it. That's like watching me ride a bicycle and then thinking you're going to get on it. Look at the problem, cover up my solution, try to do it yourself. Make sure that you always identify the first thing you want to identify is what quadrant is it in, what would be reasonable answers. And then make sure that the quadrant for your answer is the quadrant you started with and that your prism amount and your final axis is reasonable with respect to what you were given in the problem. Thank you. See you next week.